how does the salary cap for 2025 impact the 2024 NFL draft? It impacts it more than you think. And it also lays a blueprint for how the Minnesota Vikings can continue building this team. So we're going to talk about the salary cap health. We're going to talk about what it means moving forward and how the Vikings can potentially maximize quarterback of the future. Welcome to the Real Forno Show. Welcome to the Real Forno Show, hosted by Tyler Fornis, publisher at the Sporting News, contributor on Score North Purple Daily, publisher of Substack Run In Shooter, the host of The Good, The Bad, and The Hungry on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network, and a founding member of Vikings first and score. Okay. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of The Real Forno Show. I'm your host, Tyler Forno. with me, as always, in the top right corner. He is producer Dave. Dave, we're going to talk a lot about the salary cap today, but I think we have to start the show with an honorary... Ha, 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 ha. Stefan Diggs got traded again after more cryptic tweets. I'm in a group chat with some Buffalo people and they were all like, uh, like kind of worried. And then some of them weren't. And I'm like, look, you don't have anything to be worried about until it actually happens. Cause this is just digs being digs. Well, it happened. And not only that, the Vikings were involved in the trade by the 42nd overall pick being sent from Houston to Buffalo for a 2025 fifth and a 2024 sixth along with Stefan Diggs. just, Wild. There, there have been some stories floating around about how Diggs didn't want to be there. There are even some stories floating around about, hey, they don't want, um, like, he didn't trust Josh Allen because there were the rumors about him and his then fiance breaking up the night before that Bengals game that just ended up being a disaster. Like, just some hilarious things going around. And Diggs moving on. Look, Houston could be a juggernaut this year. Stroud had good weapons last year, developing weapons. Now he has a full arsenal in year two. They could keep him at a affordable price for three more years. And Diggs's contract ends, I believe going into the 2027 season, but because he was traded after that extension, they can get rid of him relatively quickly. If they so choose. What do you think about the trade, Dave? Cause I thought it was hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> It was, it was, it did elicit some humor. There are truth to all rumors and at least those rumors. <clears throat> and he is gone now. I think it's great for the Texans. As long as he's happy, Texans are going to be deadly. The That adds that third star wide receiver down there to go with their young quarterback. That They're going to be a tough match. So it's going to be interesting to watch and I can't wait till we play them this season and also when they play the Cowboys because that'll be a local broadcast to watch that because you know it's going to be fireworks oh yeah it's it's going to be wild and I can't wait to see the Texans but that's not why you're here you no. are here to have a conversation about the Minnesota Vikings there's not a whole lot going on in Vikings land let's just be a hundred percent real with what's going on because well it's the beginning of april mock drafts are coming out and we're still in the process of kind of identifying this class and to me it's about this is about trying to identify some deeper questions and answering them and understanding hey what can this be how can we try to gather as much information as we can to understand what the plan is and looking forward so that's how, what we're going to do today we are going to look forward at what's going on with the Minnesota Vikings. And that means the salary cap. Now, right now, over the cap has the Minnesota Vikings with $16.8 million in salary cap space. And that includes every contract. Everybody is, is accounted for. Or total. No. Uh, um, the effective cap space, it will be around 9 or $10 million. So here's what effective cap space means. And the reason I'm not really using effective cap space right now because it's going to change with the in incumbency of what the top five pick is going to be. 
and how those draft pick trades get modified. Effective cap space includes what you're projected to have to pay uh, rookie contracts that you're expected to come in. So the Vikings are going to have nine rookie deals and you're going to have to have cap space to pay for those guys. So theoretically, the Vikings could sign a $5 million free agent, still have about $5 million left with the effective cap space. But that cap space has to account for the practice squad, which is going to be around three or $4 million. It's going to have to account for in season moves. Remember back in 2016, when like 5 million offensive linemen were getting hurt, that plays into it too. Well, (sighs) it was very frustrating. Um, So there are elements there that have to be taken into consideration, which is why I think 16.8 million is a very healthy number and whatever's left over. Guess what? That goes to next year. But we're not talking about this year's salary cap. We have to at least mention it when we're having these conversations because we have we're talking about the 2025 salary cap. And and they still kind of having get some free agents between now and Mm -hmm. the start of training camp. Most of them won't qualify because they'll be vet minimums. So Mm -hmm. keep that in mind. Yep. So there's a lot of different things here that that are going to impact next year's cap. One of them, Justin Jefferson. He is not on next year's salary cap. Number two, Christian Derrissaw, not on next year's salary cap. So even though the Vikings are projected to have $102 million in salary cap space, here's the here's the thing with that. One, that's going to go up. Because right now, over the cap has it projected, I believe, at $260 million. Yeah, that number's fine, but it's going to go up probably another $30 million. If it goes up another $30 million, from 255.4, let's just say it goes up a flat 30, 285.4. So the Vikings would be gaining another $25 million in salary cap space. So 127 million. Let's let's kind of go from there because I I don't believe and I will look at how over the cap is projecting out. Um, yeah, they're still at a $260 million salary cap space, which the Vikings are fourth in projected salary cap space, effective cap space, they are fifth. So look, it's interesting, right? Now, here's some of the things with the Viking salary cap space. There's a lot of dead money. Um, And this isn't an official dead money. Nothing's official until the player has officially moved off the roster or a certain date hits. Harrison Smith, contract voids out. Now, if he retires, what they can do is they can kind of fudge the money and spread it out over two years. It'll be around $10 million if he just retires and they don't do anything with the contract because everything, all the void year money in the future will just vest to the current year. If they do some funny money, it'll be $6.57 million. Not too bad. Not great either. It's... It's kind of one of those things you just kind of have to deal with it. You take you took care of your guy. And as an organization, there's something about being having all those elements of the fiscal responsibility where you're having the conversation of, hey, we need to focus on the salary cap with this guy rather than taking care of him. Well, that can impact you in future negotiations. Well, how do I know you're going to take care of me? Because you didn't take care of him and he's going to be in your ring of honor. So it's important to understand the business practices around these things and not just having the conversations solely focused on, hey, we need to save salary cap space. We need to be smart about this, that, and the other thing. That's not how it works. You have to be careful on those elements. So Byron Murphy also has $4.2 million in void year money that will vest. That's a significant amount. Well, if they extend him, then you can fudge the cap hit there. So an extension is very possible for Byron Murphy. He has played well. He did get hurt and miss the last three games of the year, but he's going to be healthy. You have a guy like Josh Oliver who can be cut relatively easily. Um, He's got a a cap hit of, sorry, 9.4 million. And you can cut him for a $1.42 million dead cap hit. So you, you, there's maneuverability here. Brian O'Neill. He's going to have a $26 million dead cap hit. That's pretty substantial. But we we also did some funny money with him. 
the $26 million dead cap hit for, or sorry, a cap hit for Brian O'Neill. It's fine. You don't love it, but you can deal with it. It's Brian O'Neill is a damn good football player. Next up is TJ Hawkinson at 15.1. After that, not, not exactly um, massive cap hits. You have uh, Andrew Van Ginkle at 12.4. Sorry, Jonathan Gennard's got a 22.3. Um, they don't have, so I forgot that uh, over the cap doesn't have future years um, organized per chart. So where they're at in base salary in their cap hit in 2024, they just keep the same table moving forward. And the cap numbers don't automatically adjust. So it's a little bit of a flaw with how the site is kind of built with their coding. It's fine. But yeah, you have Grenard, you have O'Neill, you have Hawkinson, you have Andrew Van Ginkle at 12.4. Blake Cashman's at 7.075. Yeah, and there's really nothing crazy, but here's the catch. Only 32 players on the roster. So we're not exactly entering free agency with like, oh, we we'll, we've got 47 players. We can just shell out th- five guys, 20 million a piece, and we're good. No, you have to basically build the entire back end of your roster with the with this money. You have to utilize draft picks, which you're probably going to uh, allocate around eight to ten million dollars for draft pick money, which is fine. Nothing wrong with that. It's a pretty normal process to be uh, have that that money in there. And you have to try and figure out, okay, how are we going to attack? How are we going to continue to plan? Because if you take that quarterback now, you got to have a plan because you need to maximize that rookie contract. If they hit, yeah, well, then you, you know, Patrick Mahomes is still doing pretty well on that second deal, but the rookie contract window, if Drake may, or J.J. McCarthy, or Jaden Daniels is making a $10 million dead cap hit for four years when you have like quarterbacks making average annual value of over $50 million. You could have a Daniil Hunter, and you could probably then have a Jonathan Grenard. You could have both of them. Why? Because you have a rookie contract. And that's why they're so valuable. Is it necessary to win? No. Makes math problem easier. Think about this. Algebra class. You've got multiple variables. And you have to try and figure out for X, Y, Z, and Q. Having a rookie quarterback, they just give you the the value for Q. And then all you have to do is figure out the other three. Makes the problem significantly easier. And when you have that element being given to you it makes a big difference dave makes a really really big difference and i hope the vikings are able to have that now i will say there will be nine players accounted for in next year's salary cap after the nfl draft that is if the vikings make all nine picks why because they're going to sign four-year contracts and that matters. Now, your UDFAs are going to sign their... The UDFAs get three-year deals, technically. You only guarantee a certain amount just to get them in the door. Like Ivan Pace, I think, got a $20,000 signing bonus. Andre Carter got, I think, almost 340000 guaranteed. Well, if you hit the practice squad, you're only going to get like an extra $100,000 on top of your practice squad money. But Andre Carter made the roster, so it didn't even matter. But... This number is going to change after the draft. And you know what? That's okay. Because you're still working with a lot of money. So if it changes about 10-ish million dollars, you're down to about $117 million in effective cap space. Well, there's no Jefferson or Derrissaw. They're going to exercise Christian Derrissaw's fifth-year option, which we're going to conservatively put just for ease sake. I don't know what the exact number is, but just to make it simple, $25 million. Okay, so $25 million, that drops you to $93 million. Sorry, $92. It's still a lot of money. If Justin Jefferson signs an extension, then you're talking about a varied cap hit. So it depends when he signs the extension. 
if he signs it now, you're pushing a lot of that $19.2 million into the future. You're probably turning that entire 2024 salary into a signing bonus, making his cap it this year around ah, 5 million. And then that saves you 14 million on the salary cap now, which will eventually roll over. So next year's cap, it could be anywhere from like, I don't know, five, 6 million to 30. So let's just go with 30. Let's go worst case scenario here. So $30 million cap it. Now you're at $62 million in the salary cap space. Okay. Not exactly a litany of free agents. Cause remember that 2021 draft class kind of stunk. You have Cam Bynum. You have Christian Dersaw, who's going to get that uh, fifth year option. So that he doesn't really count Pat Jones. That's pretty much it. Byron Murphy is going to be a free agent, but you can re-sign him. So let's say they re-sign him. They give him 12 million. So now you're down to $50 million in salary cap space. 50 million is a lot of money to play with. That would be the top half of the league. Easy, probably top 10. The top two teams, I think have like 90 and $70 million going into the year. Go, sorry, going into free agency. So even so, $50 million, you re-sign Jefferson, you have you get Christian Darris on the fifth-year option. Like, Dave, that's still a lot of money to play with, and I think the Vikings should be pretty excited about that. Now, they can give Darris on the fifth-year option, or they could flat-out extend him before that. Mm-hmm. Well, I think no matter what, they're going to give him the fifth-year option because it, it puts less pressure on them and they don't have to use the franchise tag because hey, plenty of guys get the fifth year option and then just get extended. Mm-hmm. I, the only player I can recall that didn't get the fifth year option and got extended right away was Jordan love, but they gave Jordan love a max value of what the fifth year option was, but they only guaranteed about half of it. Why Jordan love was an anomaly. He was an unknown. It didn't matter that he was in the building for three years. Hell, Guys who stink are in buildings for three years. Chase Daniel barely did anything in the NFL. He was in buildings for over a decade. Made a lot of money as a backup. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be good. And you're paying a guy because you think they're going to be good because they're going to project forward that they're going to be good. Those things all matter here. And the fifth year option to me, the guy is good and you want to keep him on your team. You got to do it. And it's not like old fifth year options where guys like Harrison Smith were getting fifth year options. It was only guaranteed for injury. Only the top 10 picks had it fully guaranteed. But once the season started, then it became fully guaranteed. That changed with the new CBA. I believe the first class to really be able to benefit from that was the 2018 class. And I remember there was a lot of discussion about Baker Mayfield. Do you want to give him the fifth year option? Is he going to be worth the fifth year option? Cause he was kind of like up and down. He didn't end up being worth the fifth year option per se, but they were able to trade him. I mean, they still ate half of it and then they traded for Deshaun Watson. So you could argue if it did or didn't work out for the Cleveland Browns. But at the end of the day, a fifth year option is a phenomenal tool for teams to be able to keep players around. Plus the players just get the money fully guaranteed. I don't know many players who have a $25 fifth year, $25 million fifth year option. I would say, nah, I'm good. That situation is probably hella toxic if that's the case. And if that's the case, do you want that guy in your building? If he's just going to hate everything you do because of what he believes to be a toxic environment, probably not. So to me, Darius is on the team, no matter what, in 25, Jefferson is a little bit more of a fluid situation. I think he's going to be on the team no matter what, because the Vikings have shown no indication of trading him and don't get it twisted. The Vikings are not going to trade Justin Jefferson because Stefan Diggs got traded. No, I saw some of that. I saw some people being serious about it. Some, some people joking. Look, Diggs Are you telling traded. me all those Patriots fans saying we're <clears throat> going to trade him three first rounds and Justin Jefferson isn't true? 
I know there are a lot of fans listening to this show and, and please, please understand that it come from a place of place of honesty and respect. Fans are stupid. Fans are dumb because fans think with their hearts more than they think with their heads. And you know what? There's some times where I get on that track too. Don't listen to fans on Twitter. Listen to the people that you believe come at it with a rational point of view. And you know what? They're not always going to be right. But the thing is, they're going to try and look at it with good process. And fans don't. Fans look at it very partial. And they're not looking at things rationally. The word fan is a short for fanatic. Nothing about a fanatic is rational. Absolutely nothing. Keith says if they franchise Justin Jefferson, then he'll never sign a deal here. Why? Why is that a precursor for him never signing a contract? To me, that doesn't mean anything unless he explicitly says, no, trade me. A franchise tag just means he's going to get like $30 million. Like, it's a leverage tool. It's a bargaining chip. He's he's going to get that guaranteed. And a lot of guys who end up getting franchise tag, they sign extensions. So I, I don't think uh, that's a one-to-one correlation personally. Let's uh, let's kind of talk about a couple more things with the salary cap here because I, I think they are interesting. <clears throat> there are guys that you can modify and you can modify their... All right, hold on. Keith is saying you can't say JJ won't be traded. I didn't say it. Quasey did. Quasey said Justin Jefferson will not be traded. We have it has not been a thought. Like knowing Quasey the way I do, and I say this meaning I watch all the pressers, I listen to and read his words. He is somebody who's going to beat around the bush on everything, and he's not going to tell you what he's actually thinking. A lot of that stems from he did that USA Today piece. But when he actually says something that hard and powerful, he means it. That was, I'm going to, I'm going, I'm just going to tell you straight up. No, we haven't thought about trading him. That, that was real. It's like when Daniil Hunter talked. Daniil Hunter never really talked at all. But when he did talk, the words just meant something a little more because he's intentionally trying to tell you something. To me, that was kind of the same thing with Quasey saying that they haven't given any thought to trading Justin Jefferson. They're not trading him. So to me, it's a non-starter. I, Justin Jefferson is not getting traded. And you know what? If he does get traded, something changed between that process at the combine and... Now, Keith, players get tagged all the time and it, and it works out for both sides. Sometimes players hate getting tagged because they want to leave. Sometimes players get tagged and they work out a long-term deal. Dak Prescott is about to finish his four-year contract. And there are plenty more examples of that. So to me, uh, franchise tag is, it's kind of anti-labor, but at the same time, it gets guys paid, so it's it's a weird dichotomy. Let's talk about some contracts that they can kind of restructure if they need to create cap space next year. They could do Brian O'Neill. Now, Brian O'Neill is an interesting case here because he does have he does have a seventeen point four million dollar base salary, but twenty three or sorry twenty four to twenty five, he's got an at $8 million prorated signing bonus. And 2026, they uh, is just a 3.73. So if you were to modify his contract in 2025, then you would be make like, you could do it in half. You could add void years. You could also do an extension. An extension is a possibility here too. O'Neill will be 30 years old next year. So when you take a look, $17.4 million, if you basically take 16 of it, split it eight and eight, you're going to decrease your cap hit by $8 million, but then you're going to create a $31 million dead cap hit in 26. So some of these things are not necessarily conducive for long-term success and long-term flexibility. 
which is why the Vikings don't do haven't been doing a ton of restructuring with Quasi Mensa. They've done some. They've had to do some. They did it with Kirk. They just did it with Harrison Smith, but it was a little bit different because his final year, they basically voided out because they. I think both sides have just come to the realization that he is going to retire. And if you're going to retire, well, this is a good way to do it. You're taking a, the hit for us, and then we get to modify your contract on the back end. And now Harrison Smith gets to leave the Vikings. He gets a, a good last payday. And the Vikings are in a good spot next year. With even without Harrison Smith, now they still have to replacement safety. They may actually may not have to replacement safety if they keep Cam Bynum, and then then they have Josh Metellus. You still have the wild cards with Lewisine, Jay Ward, and Theo Jackson. One of those guys is probably going to be good, and then you have three safeties. You feel pretty good about having three safeties. I don't think the Vikings want to do a lot of three safety looks. They're doing three safety looks because they have to because they don't trust their linebackers. I think that's a big factor of why the Vikings ended up doing a lot of those three safety packages. It wasn't because they wanted to, because they felt they had to. And those things factor in, and they matter in these scenarios. Let's take a look at a couple other guys, because I, th- I think it's interesting to at least start having the conversation. Jonathan Grenard has a $22.3 million dead cap hit. He's got multiple years on his deal because he has void years and he's got an $18.39 million salary. So he has two void years on his contract. You, uh, one of them has $0 in it, which is 2029. One of them is 2028 has 3.3 million. You could basically take $17 million and split it between the next five years. You could do that if you wanted to, like there are ways to create salary cap space you don't always want to do that. You don't always want to create salary cap space with guys because any dollar that's paid will have to hit the salary cap at some point. That's what the dead money means. And it also dead money also means if you have a guarantee that wasn't paid, but it still needs to be paid and you moved and you cut the guy, if you trade the guy, the guarantee travels, but if you cut him, then you have to pay that guarantee both in cash Unless there's offset language and then you can pay less of it. And then you also have to pay it on the salary cap. So if a guy has a $10 million guarantee, but you cut him, you remember Alex Boone got cut one year after his contract. Uh, He signed it. If he had a $10 million guarantee, nobody signs him. Guess what? You owe him $10 million. Somebody signs him for 5 million. You only with offset language. You can only owe him 5 million. And then that saves on your salary cap. That saves your pocketbook. That matters. And all those things factor in when you're having these discussions. So Grenard is an interesting one here. Otherwise, it's Andrew Van Ginkle, 10.78 million. He's got some void years, but I think that the idea is that they wanted to keep him long term. If you're probably not going to restructure Christian Darisaw, actually, you can't without an extension because it's a fifth year option, but you could extend him and get that cap it down to like five or $10 million and make it a little easier for 25. And then it's basically like an interest free loan. You're asking future years with more money to pay for it. It's like, Hey, I'm 17 years old. I want to buy this car, but future me in 2020 uh, when I'm 21 years old is going to have the money to pay for it. So I just push it back. Now that's not how it works when you're trying to buy a car. But that's just the kind of general premise. You're asking your future self when you're going to have more ability to pay for it, to pay for it. It's a practice every team uses. Some teams abuse it. The Eagles abuse it like crazy. The Saints abuse it even more than they do. But you can use it with some guys to maneuver and get the best results for your team this year. But you don't want to do it everybody. You want to be smart about it. You want to maneuver and do the right thing for your current front team and the future of it as well. And I think to me, that's a really big factor here, Dave. It's trying to figure out how it all meshes. Oh, I almost forgot. Sam Darnold next year is a $5 million dead cap hit. There's a chance he could come back as a backup. 
who knows if he does, if he plays well, he's probably going to parlay that into something else. But there's, there's some interesting things when it comes to the, the salary cap in 2025. There is, and but it, they have all sorts of room to do it. What I wrote in a pre-show message is that Brzezinski's not going to know what to do. He's been so trying to figure out how to squeeze money out of nothing for so mm-hmm. long, and that if he has a lot of money, he's not, he's like, oh my God, are we rotating, you know, 10, 15 years ago when we start front-loading contracts? Uh Hopefully that's the case because you haven't talked about that, but they could take a Jefferson extension or an Adarisaw extension, either one or both, and push a bunch of that money forward Mm -hmm. so that it gets paid when we have a lot of cap space like next year. And then you have more room on the next years of those contracts because they aren't as expensive that you can play around with so that you suddenly have that cushion that you could use to get, hey, I need to get this free agent that we've been, you know, eyeballing and think will be the next great thing and the answer to it, getting us to the Super Bowl. You now have the space and the capability of doing such. And that's what I like that Quasi has done in setting us up for the 2025 season when it comes to cap space. And beyond, hopefully. Mm-hmm. It's it's going to be really interesting to kind of see what ends up manifesting with this 2025 salary cap space. And I think Brzezinski's going to have a lot of fun because now he can be creative with money when he has assets to be creative with. He doesn't have to f- mess around. He already has the money. And now you can figure out things when you have the ability to. And I think that is a really big thing here. The Vikings already have it. It's a lot easier to mess around with Legos that you have than trying to piece together something without the the Legos needed to finish the project. And to me, that's, that's a really big part of the conversation. Yeah, uh, my hair, Dave's beard uh, combined, we are a real Viking. Like, I I have facial hair. I don't have that. Not even close. Um, I'm trying to grow it longer, believe it or not. Hey, you know what? It's well-maintained. That's what matters. Um, Yeah, guys, that's really about all I have today. And I know we normally have about 20 more minutes. Let's do some questions. What kind of questions do you guys have? Because, uh, I think there's some really interesting things to talk about when it comes to this Minnesota Vikings team. I think it's a fun team to kind of talk about right now. Obviously they're probably going to trade for a quarterback in 22 days. That's very, very fun, but it's, it's a, it's a long conversation. It's, there's a lot of different things to kind of look like, um, Jay asks with the JJ extension, what would then the cap look like for free agents? We kind of went over that, Jay. And if you weren't here, I'll kind of go over it again. I'm projecting out there to be around $127 million in salary cap space. Over the cap is 102, but it's only projecting out to be a $260 million cap. This year is a $255.4 million cap. Last year it went up over $30 million. So I'm just going to conservatively project a $30 million bump. So the 127 million. You're going to bring back uh, Christian Darius on the fifth year option that brings it on 102. And then I would guess that Jefferson, if he signs an extension now, would have a $25 million dead cap hit next year. I, I would guess around $50 million is what the Vikings will have to make make moves in free agency. And I think that's important. 
they'll have around $50 million. $50 million is a lot of money. And look, maybe you can't sign the big names, but you can sign guys to fill holes. You can sign the right guys. The right guys matters here. And I, th- I think that's important. 50 million is plenty. You, you could get like, Jonathan Grenard's only got a $5 million de- uh, salary cap hit this year. You could get a Grenard again. You could get an Andrew Van Ginkle again. Like there's still plenty to play with. There's some good questions that flew by. One I want to take from a member, Patrick Carms. Is Lewis seen and Booth salvageable? Yeah. Will they be? I don't know. But the they're absolutely salvageable. Now that Lewis seems going to be two full years removed from that brutal leg injury, and he's had a full year with Brian Flores system. And like Look, I really don't know if he's going to be anything, but I'm at least holding out hope that he could be. And I'm not going to bury the guy. I'm not going to say that he is absolute garbage. Look, if he doesn't work out this year, you just you can just get rid of him. If he's that bad in training camp, you know what? Maybe it's just time to cut bait. And you know what? That's an okay proposition. But he's absolutely salvageable. There's still talent there. There's still an explosive player. You just got to figure out if he's going to ever become what he's supposed to be. Booth, I think there's more ability to him. There's uh, a better chance that he's quote unquote salvageable. It's it's an interesting conversation though, Dave, because Booth, I thought played well in short stints last year. I think he is a very good player, but he does keep getting hurt and he's not the, the greatest tackler. And that is, that's something to kind of keep in mind. You have to be a good tackler in this defense. You just have to be. Um, I, I will say, um, big um, Raylan dad, um, how do I become a member? I uh, love the show. One, thank you. Um, if you, a- after the show, you just go to the homepage and you subscribe and there should be a button that says join towards the top of the page. You can, you can join there. But if you're on your phone trying it, do not go through the YouTube app. Go through the browser. The YouTube app on a phone does not have it, or an iPad on a device does not have it. But if you're on a computer, just go to the homepage and you can see it there. Otherwise, if you're on a device, go through a browser to YouTube and you will see it there. It's one of the Mm -hmm. flaws in YouTube that we've discovered. It's good to know. Um, what other, what else do we have for questions, Dave? I've been too busy talking where I've, I've kind of missed the, what's, <laughs> have a, what's come up. A good one from R. Emmer. What okay. do you want to see from KOC and Quasi to justify an extension for those two individuals? So I think, uh, if they go and get that quarterback, you give them the extension. Now here's the thing with the extensions. You can still fire them whenever you want. If that quarterback sucks, you can still fire him after the year. The only thing that matters is the Wilfs would have to fork over a bunch of money. So I don't, I think going into year three of four, if they identify that quarterback, you extend them, give them like a two year extension or something. And then it gives them four years to figure it out with that quarterback. Now, do you necessarily want to pay a bunch of money to a guy that it's not going to be in the building? No, but you're also not planning for that guy to not be in the building. So I think it, it's it's a tough one, but it would be better to extend them earlier rather than later. Our Emmer also asks, does the new kickoff rule change how you construct your roster in terms of special teams players? It could. I don't know how teams are going to prioritize, but it feels more like a zone run. Um, with this new kickoff, then it's going to feel like a traditional one. Are you going to want to have bigger bodies in there? Are you going to want to have like maybe like an extra tight end because that tight end can move and be a better blocker than like a linebacker or receiver or a corner? It's going to be interesting how they want to play this. You could justify having like an 11th offensive lineman that you would not have had previously. I don't know how they're going to handle this, but I'm fascinated to find out because 
this return style is significantly different. I really think you're going to see a shift in who's a returner and who's not in the National Football League. It may take some time because college football does not have this rule. College football uh, still has the normal kickoff. So their return guys may not be a fit for what the NFL is doing. So I'm fascinated to kind of see what it is. Um, FT Maddie man says, now we can see what can can do. Can can't see the field in a run play. Can he see the field in a kickoff return in this style? Man, I don't know. I would have tried to sign Cordero Patterson, but the Steelers got him because I think the Steelers might actually use him in, in the run game. Yeah, but Cordero is getting old. Yeah. I, would, I Vin, trust Kane to be able to do it. He's done it as a kickoff returner before. He's still going to yeah, have but, a 20-yard buffer. Dave, it's it's a completely different style. It may not translate. It may. And, and I'm leaving that open. But we're not talking about the old school kickoff anymore. We're talking about it looking more like a zone run play. Something Kane Wangwu cannot do well at all. So to me, that's a big question mark. And you know what? Cordell Patterson might be losing a little bit of juice. He's still got great vision and he's proven that he can be effective in running zone concepts. And he's, in my opinion, the best kick returner. Now emphasize kick returner to ever play in the national football league. Not why Devin Hester's the best. Devin Hester's the best punt returner. That's not debatable. I think Cordell Patterson's the best kick returner. And even if he doesn't have all the juice, I think with this style and it being more of a zone and Hey, he's proven he can be a cutback runner. I think he translates to this very, 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 very well. Mm-hmm. Uh, Grandizer asks, is there a second to fifth round prospect that you're pounding <clears throat> the table for that the Vikings <sighs> could move up and select since the Vikings, if they they don't have a day two pick as of mm-hmm. now. They would have to move up. Now, fifth round is obviously day three, but if the Vikings had a second round pick, I would be pounding the table for Darius Robinson from Missouri. I would love Darius Robinson. You could play him anywhere. You could play him at edge. You could play him on the interior. You could play him five technique, three technique, wide nine. It doesn't matter. You can play it all. And I would love to have him. If Chop Robinson makes it in the second round, oh my gosh, I would beg and plead for Chop Robinson. Um, yeah, there's there's some interesting guys. If you're looking in day three, Cam Hart, cornerback from Notre Dame, Jarvis Brownlee, cornerback from Louisville, I would pound the table for both of those guys. Dylan Lobby, the running back from New Hampshire, I think is awesome. I think, especially with a the pass game utility. I think he can be a versatile weapon, even if he never develops as a true three down back. There's a lot of interesting players in that round four range. <sighs> Once he gets out of round four, thins out pretty quick. So that's kind of that's kind of where I'm at on guys I would pound the table for. I'd be happy with a lot more, but if if I'm gonna stake my stake my reputation, I'd stake it on those guys. I love those guys. There's a couple of questions I want to hit real quick from. Okay. Uh, let's see. Where are they? Got to scroll up because we missed them. I may have scrolled too far. They were over on the Facebook side. Oh, David Rinaldi. Good Italian name. Does Hawkinson have a legit shot at playing in September? And the second question is, what are we doing for left guard? Hawkinson, I would give him a 2% chance to play in September. He had surgery January 24th. I would be shocked if he plays it all in October, let alone in September. Um, I would only give him like a 15, 20% chance to play in October because hell, he may be ready by Halloween, but ready versus game shape ready, they may give him another week or two to really get back into shape. Uh, sorry, guys. I'm, I've been dealing with it the last few days. Uh, left guard. 
going to be honest. I don't know. Right now, Blake Brandles the starter. I don't hate it. I don't love it either. It's he would be a look if he's starting. Okay. That's fine. I guess like I can live with that, but I don't think it's Dalton Reisner. I think the Dalton Reisner idea is, needs to die because I don't think that's com- that's going to happen. I don't think the front office was overly happy with his performance. And quite frankly, his run game performance was abysmal. Um, his past game performance was fine, but man, he couldn't do much of anything. And like, just very frustrating. Um, David says, uh, riser isn't loved. Oh, buddy. The fan base does want him back. They're like, why isn't he back? What, what's going on? Yep. It's run blocking. He can't run block. He can't get to the second level. No. And you know what? Ezra Cleveland had his faults, but, but you know that. what? He, he could climb the second level and he could block linebackers. That was something that like Reisner just couldn't do. And you got to be able to do that. And you know what? If you can't do that, you better be able to maul. He can't do that either. Like Reisner's fine. He's like the pass blocking was good. FT Maddie says he didn't even allow a sack. Technically you're correct, but his pass blocking wasn't so stellar that you just deal with the crap you're unblocking. And with the money that he's uh, apparently asking for, no, I'm good. I'm fine. I don't need him on my team. We can, we can find somebody suitable to play left guard who that is. Pfft, no idea, but I really don't think that the team wants to bring back riser. Watch for the draft. Obviously mm-hmm. day three, but expect them to pick at least one interior alignment. Don't be Would shocked. Be my guess, Don't if be shocked. Three. If an interior offensive lineman comes into play with a trade for a day three pick. Could be, could be. A lot of good players get moved on draft day or day three capital. Shaq Mason, I think, was a, a draft day trade, or maybe it was a pre free agency trade. He was he went for a fifth. Dude was one of the like the ten best left guards in the in the league. So keep keep your minds open for that. Do we have any other good ones, Dave, before we head out? Well, Young's talking about trading to get uh, Frazier or BB. I like BB, what I've seen on his tape so far. But no. we're not going to have 23 because that's going to be traded yeah. for a quarterback. So to me, that's a pipe dream. Um, I, I get the idea. But look, if we're going to have 35 and 66, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm prioritizing defensive line maybe with both of those picks. And I, I would honestly love to add a wide receiver because look, Brandon Powell is your number three. Trent Sherfield's going to fight for that spot. Same with Jalen Naylor, who Gary is asking if there's any hope for him. I don't know. I was never that impressed with Naylor to begin with. So is he going to be something beats me beats me. There were some things I liked about Naylor. Now, if he can stay healthy and develop, that would be nice. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, it would be nice, but that's that's part of it. He hasn't. Emmer, our Emmer is taking your draft day trade, saying T. Higgins is going to buckle on draft day to his prediction. We'll see how that goes. And two evil. Maybe. Is saying as long as the Vikings don't trade up for a QB, we should be good. Too evil, you've got to watch two old bloggers this weekend on Sunday. Darren and I are talking to just about that. I have the notes, the numbers, broke it all down. I'm assembling it into a story, one that could be talked about, adding some visuals so everybody can see. I went back through the drafts from 1994. 25 years worth, right? I don't want to get the last few years because they don't, players hasn't been in long enough to determine. And specifically looking at quarterback and where's the best place to take a quarterback of the future 
And what are those guarantees or what are the mm-hmm. probabilities, the numbers, going to say about it? So please, to evil, join me and Darren on Sunday at 4 o'clock because I'll have it all broke down. It's a deep dive like I did a few years ago. Boy, this one's going to be done on video. So please join. There we go. And we'll leave it at that. Two old bloggers, Sunday afternoon, 4 p.m. Central time. Excuse me. And the Real Forno Show will be back next week at its normal time, 6 p.m. on Monday, 6 p.m. on Wednesday. And if anything crazy drops, we'll be going live. Thank you guys very much for joining. With that, I'm Tyler. He's Dave. Skull Vikings, baby. Skull Vikings. Like, subscribe, and ring the bell to get notifications. It helps us grow this community that we all love our Minnesota Vikings. And on behalf of Tyler Fornis and myself, Dave Stefano, thank you so dearly for watching The Real Forno Show. Skull, everyone!